if you continued on the trajectory of energy efficiency that was there for the previous generation of computing, you would not really be able to actually power the next generation. I remember someone showed me a graph that said, well, if we don't do something about energy efficiency at the component and the system design level, I'll need a nuclear reactor. Here on Technology Untangled, we're keen to show all sides of the AI debate. In previous episodes, we've highlighted the ways that AI is helping humanity, from being used to predict weather patterns, to finding new ways to help people with accessibility needs, to fighting global poverty. But we've also covered the challenges. Some of them are legal or ethical, and some of them are environmental. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Because AI is great, but it also uses a heck of a lot of energy and resources. And for all we love to celebrate the benefits it will undoubtedly have in, say, tackling climate change, we do need to look at the sustainability challenges faced by AI itself. There is an energy cost to running and training AI, and the more commonplace it becomes in our homes and our businesses, the greater the impact that it could have on our planet. So what are tech companies doing to make AI models more sustainable? And just how do you reduce the energy sucked up by training, housing, and running models around the world? You're listening to Technology Untangled, a show which looks at the rapid evolution of technology and unravels the way it's changing our world. We're your hosts, Aubrey Lovell and Michael Bird. By 2030, it is predicted the global AI market will be worth $2 trillion, according to market research platform Statista. But alongside the financial benefit sits, somewhere uncomfortably, an environmental cost. At the current rate of growth, research by Alex DeVries at the VU Amsterdam School of Business and Economics has suggested that AI servers could be using more power than some small countries, such as the Netherlands, by that time. And keeping on the theme of future forecasts, Anders Nordgren, a professor of bioethics from the Linkshopping University in Sweden, wrote in the Journal of Information, Communication and Ethics in Society that the whole industry will be responsible for 14% of the Earth's CO2 emissions by 2040. So what are the factors causing such an enormous surge in the amount of energy being consumed by AI? Hi, I'm Arthi Garg. I am a technologist in HPE's office of the CTO. I wear many hats within the organization, but um, one of those hats is to lead our sustainability innovation efforts as the lead sustainability architect for the team. You maybe have heard statistics like training a single generative AI model can generate something like 300 tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. While the specific numbers actually can be pretty difficult to measure, underlying all of this is really the fact that AI is driving kind of an exponential growth in um, demand for computing to train these very large models. And while in the sort of high performance computing and advanced computing space, energy as we move to newer generations of technologies has always been an issue, has always been a concern. Just the growth in energy demands are, are growing faster. And that's becoming one of the biggest challenges. I think really the advent of a model is not just getting larger, but there being sort of an inflection point in um, the computing requirements, which means the energy requirements of training these models and, you know, potentially also in using the models. Some of that's not really well understood right now. How do you account for the energy that's generated to power the electricity needed to power the computers that allow you to use an AI model? Do you amortize it over how many times it's been used, for example? And that's really led to people thinking um, more acutely about what is the real environmental impact of using these AI models. There's no doubt, as Arthi says, that the environmental factor is increasingly playing a part in how AI is being thought about. My name's Matt Armstrong-Barnes. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for Artificial Intelligence at Hewlett-Packard Enterprise. It's something Matt Armstrong-Barnes has had an eye on for a number of years. So, aside from bigger AIs using more energy, where does he see the problem coming from? 
I've been the CTO for AI for six years now. Uh, obviously, my interactions with AI goes back beyond that. And from a Hewlett Packard Enterprise perspective, we've had a, an AI center of excellence for more than three decades. So we've got a huge amount of experience in this space. In the last probably five years, we've seen this huge rush towards AI. The big changer of the accelerated adoption of complex AI models was the introduction of large language models. And this has really been a huge transformative technology, has an incredible amount of benefit that can be derived from it. The challenge that I see in the sustainability space, people are rushing towards it too quickly. They're not putting the right kind of planning in place. And what that means is that they're building AI in an unsustainable way. They're not thinking about the environmental impact, which means they're potentially running towards complex models too quickly. They're not thinking about longevity and how long they're going to use these models and the kind of value that they're going to drive out of them. They're not factoring in how they can change them. You know, things change over time, especially when you're starting to deal with large volumes of data. Reusability. You know, if I put a lot of time, effort and energy into the construction of a model, I might want to reuse it and build it in such a way that it provides me with more than just one outcome. And lastly, we're not necessarily gathering a holistic set of metrics around the models that we're producing. And what this is resulting is we're not making the best and informed decisions. As Matt says, in the last five years, the adoption of AI and large language models has grown at a rate that we can barely keep up with. In fact, a report by Traction, which is an industry research company, discovered that there were more than 18,500 AI startups in the US in the summer of 2023. And that rush to adopt AI at such a pace has an inevitable effect on the environment. Yes. In fact, according to research by OpenAI, the energy used by AI models has doubled every 3.4 months since 2012. And at the heart of all of that energy usage is the hardware that AI sits on and runs through. My name is Shardnar Simon, and I'm the Director of Product Marketing for NVIDIA's Data Center GPU portfolio. Sustainable AI means a series of business practices that help minimize the impact of all of your workflows on the environment and on the planet. It involves looking at all of the stages of your regular operations and identifying how they could be modified to reduce your carbon footprint and meet targets such as your carbon reduction goals like net zero. My team actually launches our data center GPUs and uh, all of our corresponding architectures the likes of which power popular chatbots that you may have heard of. Those same generative AI models require a lot of compute to train, which in turn translates to energy that's consumed in the data center. In data centers in particular, energy efficiency is a big component of sustainability. And one of the really amazing things about data centers has been their ability to hold energy consumption largely flat over the last decade. So how, with all this extra demand for AI and energy being put into training it, have individual data centers managed to hold their power use steady over the years? Well, there's been a massive change in hardware use for a start, as CPUs, or known as central processing units, have been replaced with graphical processing units, or GPUs and AI architecture. GPUs are 20 times more energy efficient than the most advanced CPU counterparts at AI and HPC workloads. They have this unique ability to perform very large matrix to matrix multiplication calculations very quickly. And they have incredible throughput that they can accomplish by the use of thousands of what we call CUDA cores in our NVIDIA GPUs. A good analogy I can give you as to why a GPU is so much more efficient than, say, a CPU is to compare it to a moving truck. If you're moving homes and you want to transport all of your furniture from one home to another, a moving truck can help you do that in, in just a single trip. Your alternative might be to hire a fleet of cars, disassemble all of your furniture, and spend days putting it and stuffing it into this fleet of cars CPUs are like the car. They're general purpose and they do a lot of things, but they don't excel at very specific workloads. 
GPUs are like that moving truck. They're just extremely efficient and performant at specific workloads. GPUs are just really efficient at parallel processing. These are the types of calculations that are heavily used in AI and scientific simulations when you're trying to figure out what's taking place in every single pixel in, say, a real world simulation. So this advantage of AI extends to graphics processing workloads, as well as data analytics. What Shar's talking about makes complete sense, but it does throw up a confusing question. If the processing power around AI is getting much more efficient to the extent that data center energy usage is flat, why is AI still consuming more and more energy? Here's Matt. Generative AI, and specifically large language models, have captured the imagination of the general public. Lots of people are now using them in a much more regular way than they had done historically. And that means that AI has moved beyond the traditional boundaries that it was in before, technology, data science, analytics, and it's now in the regular parlance of the business community. And the business community are looking at the large language models that they're using, saying, these are very easy to use. You know, I use them in my day job to provide some insights or to summarize or do a whole variety of tasks. Can I now bring them into a business context? And that's where things start to get a little bit more complex because the large language models that are more publicly available are general purpose. Whereas when you want to bring them into a business context, you'll want to tackle specific business problems for you and you'll want to combine your business data with the capabilities that you get from a large language model. So it sounds as though the answer is there in terms of really focusing the GPU energy on what is actually needed. But how do you make that happen? And how are people like Arthi and companies like HPE approaching it? So I think that there's a lot of different things that we are already doing. You know, maybe the first thing is to just be more thoughtful in how you train. What are the methods you use? Also, um, a common thing when you're training models is sometimes to do an ensemble approach. And so you train a lot of different models and kind of compare which of those models performs the best. There are ways to be smarter about navigating the parameter space of what possible models, for example. And so that can be one way to reduce the just the number of computations that go into training a model. Yeah, so that's a really important point. By making an AI that uses less computation, you make an AI that uses less electricity. And it goes further. The way you interact with an AI makes a difference too. Here's Matt. So there's been some academic research that looks at publicly available large language models as a baseline and then looks at more targeted large language models specifically designed to tackle certain business problems and the impact around something called prompt engineering, which is how you make sure the large language model is addressing your problems in the right kind of way. And what what this academic research is finding is if you use a specific model targeted at your problems, you will outperform a general large language model. And the other thing that you get when you start to employ large language models specific to your problem, with your data, which is this added complexity, you avoid what's known as hallucination. So hallucination is if a large language model doesn't know the answer, it will make it up. So it is entirely possible that what you're getting out of your general purpose large language model is not true. Whereas when you apply specific large language models and you bolt in knowledge bases with your data, not only do you reduce the possibility of hallucination, but also you get explainability because you can link the answer that comes out of your large language model and its implementation back to your knowledge base to find out where the large language model got the answer. Of course, it makes sense that you need fewer parameters if you're using AI for specific needs, and that in turn uses a lot less energy. Think of it as sitting in a room with the lights on. You only need the lights on in that room. Leaving the lights on in the rest of the house is just wasting energy. And you can take it one step further. Not just making the AI more focused, but making the way you code the AI more focused too. 
The focus on sustainable methods is something software developers have been doing for a while. So now it's a case of others in the industry catching up, but as Matt explains, it has to be done in an informed way. So software engineering for decades has been about building secure, maintainable, robust, environmentally friendly systems. And there's some great principles that we need to take out of that discipline and make sure that we are applying them when we build AI models. Also, we need to build them in right from the very beginning. So retrospectively applying some of this thinking doesn't necessarily have the right kind of impact. The other one is repeatability, which comes through automation. So there's something called machine learning operations, which is a way of applying repeatable processes to your AI lifecycle as you're starting to construct it. And it's the same with generative AI. We need to start embedding some of these principles right from the beginning. And it goes beyond the coding into the language itself. So Python heavily used by the data science community. And it's a great language, very good, easy to learn, great set of libraries and frameworks, and very, very well set up for data science workloads. However, Python is an interpreted language. And what that means is you can't fix inefficiencies through the compilation process. So lots of other languages are compiled. And what computer science did was built into compilers a way of going, oh, I know what you're trying to achieve, but you've done it in slightly the wrong order. So if I were to fix that order for you, it will run quicker, it will be more efficient, it'll, it'll make use of memory more effectively. Using interpreted languages doesn't involve a compiler that can fix a lot of these little inefficiencies for you. And what that means is you can use, you know, very easy to use interpreted languages, and it's actually very simple to make little errors that produce inefficiencies into your code. And if your code is running a significant number of times, that then means your code is exponentially inefficient. Where you can start to use Python very effectively is by using the libraries. So Python has got a great collection of libraries available on open source that have been written in a highly efficient manner. So having that depth of understanding of how to use the tools that you have efficiently ultimately means that you're going to come out with a solution that is highly performant, runs better, requires less computational resources, and the byproduct of that is that you're producing less carbon output. That idea of more efficient code and use of resources is something that Shah's team are also working on and are keen to encourage others to pursue as well in order to make their AI workloads more efficient and get more out of their hardware. We have highly optimized libraries that lets us process data with both high throughput as well as efficiency. We have a, a library called Nickel, N-C-C-L, and it actually allows multiple GPUs to work in concert with each other by automatically optimizing the route that data is transited between all of these GPUs so that it gets to its destination very quickly. There are optimizations that we call kernel fusion, where you can perform multiple operations together or migrate operations to more efficient and what we call reduced positions where you're using less memory to store the same type of information. And both of those increases throughput and thus reduces energy consumption. And then if you look at another step above the libraries, within the AI models themselves, we contribute very heavily to public domain knowledge on state of the art of the AI networks themselves. So, for example, we'll optimize kernels that are within the AI models that improve efficiency in many of the most widely used models. And we make these updates freely available to the entire community as containers on NGC, which is our own software repository. Okay, so we've looked at more efficient hardware, we've looked at more efficient software, and we've looked at more efficient coding. So what's next? Well, there's a final piece to the puzzle. And it may seem niche, but it can make a huge difference to efficiency. 
And that's quite literally moving everything closer together. You see, moving electrical signals through wire, cable, or chips uses energy. So the more cabling that electricity has to move through to supply data from one part of an AI system to another, the less efficient it is. And you may think that that difference is minuscule, but it very quickly adds up. Here's a recent clip of Technology Untangled from HP Chief Technologist Mike Woodacre talking about the makeup of the Frontier Exascale supercomputer. It's got about 38,000 GPUs, 8, 9,000 CPUs, 90 miles of our high-performance slingshot Ethernet interconnect in that system. One of the big bottlenecks is feeding the processing elements with data. And so you want very high bandwidth access to memory. But the challenge is they're built out of DRAM. DRAM doesn't like heat, right? It's a reliability issue. So then cooling these chips to make them reliable is very challenging. Frontier is obviously an extreme example, but the problem is one that all data centers share. You need to move data over huge distances, which creates heat and uses energy, which can make the system less reliable. So what do you do? Well, you can move everything closer together, by which we mean a lot closer. As Shar explains, that can be done with hardware or by software optimized by AI itself. If you look sort of how do we move data between GPUs within a server? A typical server in a data center can have as, as many as 16 GPUs all working together. When we look at the really large language models, we would tend to use hundreds of GPUs, if not in some cases for the really large ones, thousands of, of GPUs working in concert. For the massive end of the scale, when we're looking at large language models, Having uh, thousands of GPUs working in concert is how those are typically solved. And uh, when you look at these very large models that go into hundreds of billions of parameters, those are actually done by entire clusters of, of GPUs themselves. Being able to send data back and forth between all of those GPUs so it's in the right place at the right time, we have an interconnect technology called NVLink and NVSwitch that allows you to move data around at about 900 gigabytes per second. We also have smart networking products that allow us to move data between servers very efficiently and, and very quickly. And some of those involve smart networking technologies that can perform actually some of these basic AI calculations within the network itself. So you're not fetching and writing data back and forth between a GPU as often you're just making some typical functions, making those calculations within the network rather than reading and writing to the GPU. And so when you look at how the world is today, data centers are today, when you've got power constrained data centers that are focused on some of these really demanding applications, you can essentially double your performance within the exact same power envelope. So a data center operator, they don't need to run brand new high power voltage lines to bring new electricity out to a data center to upgrade all of their capabilities. So we've looked at building the models to be more sustainable, but what about when they're up and running? Well, one way to ease the pressure on storage systems is simply getting rid of erroneous data. Essentially, it's the equivalent of emptying your desktop recycling bin, but on a much, much bigger scale. Yes, it's called data debt. Here's Matt Armstrong Barnes on how clearing out the extra storage waste can help achieve sustainability. When it comes to data debt, data debt accumulates quickly because we're generating so much data on a daily basis. What you need to do to data is make sure that it is cleaned so that it is valid and accurate representation of the data you have so it doesn't have anomalies in it or missing data or, or outliers that are going to going to skew your analysis when it comes to avoidance of data debt the only real way that you can achieve it is with prevention because once you have accrued a significant data debt it becomes a massive undertaking to resolve it so if you were to imagine for a moment somebody sends you a spreadsheet and I can guarantee you, when you look at that spreadsheet, it's never going to be quite fit for your needs. 
So what do you do? Well, you save the original, just in case you need it, and then you transform, you create new columns, you might put in new formulas, you transform the data and you create a new version. In most cases, the underlying data is still the same. And actually, most organizations will back up their data at least once. So that means you've now got four copies. And in data science, data science is an experimental discipline where you do need to apply transformations of the data. You need to normalize it. You need to apply a number of statistical techniques to make sure that it is ready for you to perform AI techniques against it. And as a result, that does mean that you run the risk of creating multiple copies of the same data so that you can go back to the original source if your data is incorrect, and then you've backed it up. You've now got this enormous explosion of data that you are storing, which means that it becomes quite expensive because it's consuming power, it needs cooling, and as a result, that's, you know, there's a big producers of CO2. Yeah, Matt is absolutely right. The European Parliament published a report that shows data centres, digital networks and other ICT consume about 7% of the world's electricity today. The same report states it also currently takes around 40% of all energy consumption to use at data centres just to cool it down. So it's pretty clear on why saving energy is such an urgent issue. So pure energy efficiency is what sustainability in AI essentially comes down to. If you're getting rid of excess data, coding well, and using efficient hardware intelligently, you're going to reduce that carbon footprint. So what comes next? Here's Arthi. Tech companies overall, um, especially maybe in the last five to 10 years, have been very, very concerned about energy usage in their data centers overall. A lot of the very large cloud providers have fairly aggressive net zero goals and they try to power their data centers as much as possible with renewable energy. One of our biggest challenges is that we don't always have a lot of visibility. There are methods that people are trying to develop to understand what, how do I measure the energy consumption associated with a model. And so, you know, having just the visibility into the energy being used when you train a model is important. And that's something that um, we released earlier this year, the HPE Sustainable Insight Center. And that's something that allows us to kind of understand energy consumption associated with using computing systems. But there's another piece of it besides the visibility is that, you know, I'll kind of go back to the, we used to learn this when we were kids, that the three R's of waste management, reduce, reuse, and recycle. People focus a lot on recycle, but the first thing you're supposed to do is reduce. And I think that's one of the things that we're all going to have to grapple with a little bit is, um, is AI or in particularly generative AI, the right approach? To solving a given problem? Is there a different way to solve the problem that uses something that's much less computationally intensive? Going forward, we need to potentially be a little bit more intentional and parsimonious even in our use of AI in some cases. There are clearly a lot of challenges that come with this whirlwind of AI growth to make it more sustainable both in the present and for the future. But we've heard a lot in this episode that for all the many challenges, it's opened the way for exciting new tech development too. Here's Shar again. We see a lot of interest in deploying AI. And obviously there are some high profile examples where large language models have consumed a, a fair bit of electricity for that initial training. I think we need to recognize that much of that training only gets performed one time up front. And then you can reap the benefits of that initial training in a variety of different applications. So there are certainly ways we can go about making this very exciting technology more sustainable. With that in mind, here's one final piece of advice from Matt Armstrong Barnes on getting the most from your AI while being as efficient and strategic as possible. The first thing I would say is don't run at AI and generative AI. Have a strategy. Make sure you're using this technology with purpose. Because, you know, there's some great phrase from uh, The Art of War. Tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. And strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory. By having a strategy and an executable plan, 
means you're going to be more effective when it comes to building out this technology. And when you have that strategy, make sure that you consider the implications of reusability, maintainability, the capability to handle change, and make sure that you are building models that you can use for the long term. And the best way of doing that is introducing metrics gathering. So understand the implications of the decisions you make because the more knowledgeable we are, the better and more informed and educated decisions we can make. The surge in AI growth over recent years has had an impact on the environment. But what we've heard in this episode is that there is not only an awareness of the need to make AI sustainable, it's also something that is being very proactively embraced. If we can do that, it will not only benefit the planet, it'll benefit us as users too. You've been listening to Technology Untangled. We've been your hosts, Aubrey Lovell and me, Michael Bird. A huge thanks to our guests, Matt Armstrong-Barnes, Arthi Garg and Shana Simon. You can find more information on today's episode in the show notes. Do subscribe on your podcast app of choice so you don't miss out and to check out the last three series. This episode was produced by Sam Datapollin and Al Booth with production support from Harry Morton, Zoe Anderson, Alicia Kempson, Alison Paisley, Alyssa Mitri, Camilla Patel, Alex Podmore, and Chloe Suo. Our social editorial team is Rebecca Wissinger, Judy Ann Goldman, Katie Guarino, and our social media designers are Alejandra Garcia, Carlos Alberto Suarez, and Ambar Maldonado. Technology Untangled is a Lower Street production for Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Thank you.